So one of the biggest questions we have when someone comes in the office is what's the appropriate amount of tests to run on them? We know that a lot of patients are at this point in time paying out of pocket or using their high savings accounts to run some of these more advanced tests. That's one of the issues we have too, is the standard tests are covered by insurance, but they're not very good. So now we need to run better tests. What tests give you the best value? So in, in a patient who work worried about Lyme, my first question is, where have you been? I get a lot of Minnesotans and a lot of people who are in the Midwest. So I kind of have a Midwest panel. And what we're running is a Lyme blot. And it's a little more sensitive than your normal Lyme blot, um, as well as we run Bartonella and Mycoplasma antibody tests. We think those are very good. And then secondly, we run PCR, so DNA analysis for Babesia, DNA analysis for Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. Those are really your big five. Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, Mycoplasma. I will also throw in the Powassan virus testing too. That's not a huge component of what we see, but I, when I looked, it was seven to 9% of, of uh, our patients had Powassan. So I think it's becoming enough to where I need to have it in my normal battery of tests. Um, that's my standard Minnesota panel. I have a little bit expanded panel if you've been all over the world, if you've been to Europe, if you've been to Missouri, you have to add Turolemia in. If you've been to Texas, you know, if you've traveled all over and kind of been outdoors in the woods, then you need to run a little bit more. But most of the time when we come in, we're running kind of that Midwest, you know, based panel. Now, the other thing that you really want to look for is testing inflammation. And this is something that's a little bit new to my patients, but the type of inflammation can also help you determine what type of bug you're dealing with. When we're looking at inflammation, most people know about the C-reactor protein marker. And unfortunately, C-reactor protein is many, many times negative in these um, diseases. And so you're wanting to run other inflammation markers. Um, this gets really nerdy with a bunch of acronyms really fast. But when you read other Lyme disease authors, you'll find they're also checking inflammation pathways that are beyond C-reactive protein. So in our clinics, the ones that we typically run is we're running histamine, we're running what's called MMP9, we're running TGF beta-1, and we're running ECP. Now, these are a slew of, there's many more you could run, but all these tests are a little bit expensive, but it's always ideal to be looking both at the immune system reaction to these bugs or looking for the bugs directly, and then also be looking for some of the inflammation, specifically when we're talking about Babesia. So Babesia, I think the testing for Babesia is behind the testing for Lyme and Bartonella. And what we really like is running that ECP marker or immunoglobulin E or other parasite markers that tell you this is a parasite, the most likely parasite you're dealing with is Babesia. So that's one reason I really, really, really like that inflammation test as well, because I, I really believe Babesia testing to be behind the technology and some of the other testing, and it's hard to pin down Babesia without some of that inflammation testing. Um, I always prefer if patients can run both. Some patients, they cannot, and so we'll run them in sequence. We'll run one, and then we'll move on to the other as we can, or we'll add it in the protocol as we can. In Minnesota or surrounding regions, so basically upper Midwest, what have you typically seen in terms of the co-infections? Is it Bartonella? Is it Babesia? What are your number one culprits? Sure. So this is something I think we did a video a couple years ago and I was seeing so much anaplasma. We still see a good amount of anaplasma, but in the last year when I reviewed, we're catching Babesia better and noticing Babesia more. But Bartonella is probably my number one and Babesia is probably my number two and anaplasma is now the third one that I find. So I don't know, this will morph, I think, over time, depending on which regions I'm getting patients from, but that's the way it was last year. 
And I think overall, we found a co-infection at least one in 90% of our patients last year. Again, I'm only seeing patients who usually have kind of fallen through the, the cracks of the system. And I believe that co-infections are part of the reason they are falling through the cracks. So that's why I think my co-infection numbers are so high in our clinic. And when you look at studies, co-infection rates are, you know, probably more about 60%. But I think when you have those co-infections, you're, you're higher likelihood to kind of be um, the testing to be falsely negative and for other doctors to miss you. Here's what we basically think happens with, with Bartonella. You can actually get infected with Bartonella and it doesn't really seem to do anything. So there's considered, Bartonella is considered to be kind of a, a carrier. You can have it before you even get a tick bite. But here's, when they do studies, there's a really interesting study that came out in 2018 where they took a mouse and they gave it a virus and they gave it Bartonella and then they gave, you know, part of the mice Bartonella, part of them the virus, part of them both. So the Bartonella by itself doesn't, doesn't really do much. But when they gave the Bartonella and the virus together, it made the inflammation much worse than just getting the virus by itself. But also it made the antibodies much lower. So this is once again evidence that when you have Bartonella with something, it pushes the antibodies down. Why is that important? It makes your test look negative. It means doctors go, I can't find anything wrong with you. But while it's pushing the antibodies down, it's pushing the inflammation up. So if we translate this to Lyme disease, what we really believe to be happening with Bartonella is it subverts the adaptive immunity, it pushes that down, it pushes the antibodies down. So all your tests, you don't have Bartonella, you don't have Lyme disease, look, the tests are negative. But while it's doing that, it's pushing the inflammation up, which means all your symptoms are worse, which is a very frustrating place to be in. This is also why I prefer, if you can, to run both a test that checks for the bugs and a test that checks for the inflammation. So here's the scenario that happens a lot. Patients come in and their tests look negative. Even some of our more advanced tests look, well, there's some reactivity there, but it's still not clear. Everything's pretty low. And then we see on the inflammation test, all the inflammation. And so you say, okay, the antibodies look low. The inflammation looks high. How about we try to go after this for two or three months and then we'll retest. And as you see, what happens is, as you start to go after some of these things, which are pushing down these antibodies, your retest, all the tests look higher. They look more, it's more obvious, oh, you have this, and it's obvious, and it's showing up correctly. So this is why doing both those tests simultaneously can give you a lot of clarity. It's also why retesting can actually help you get a lot of clarity. I actually have, I have a lot of patients who we run the testing and I go, all right, here's what I know. Here's all the inflammation. I am suspicious this is Lyme and Bartonella, just as an example, but I don't know. And I tell people this very honestly, but I'm pretty sure. I go, here's what we do. I'm gonna go after Lyme and Bartonella, I'll retest it, and we'll find out in three months if I'm right. And what happens on that retest is it becomes very clear. Oh my gosh, the limes jumped up like a rocket. There it is. Or the Bartonella or both, right? So this is one way that testing and retesting can really create a clear picture for someone who's really had a lot of mystery for a long time. Yeah, I do have patients who ask, I don't have money for testing, I'd rather spend money on treatment. And unfortunately, every time I have gone with my heart and tried to do this, it doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm really against this because what happens is we end up getting lost along the way and without some of the tests to guide us, if you hit a lull or you hit confusion, I don't know if that's because you killed the Lyme, or you still have Bartonella, or you killed the Bartonella, but the Lyme's not better, or you killed, you killed Babesia and Lyme, but you, I don't know what's happening, which means when you walk in six months later and go, I'm not better, I don't know why, and I don't know how to move your, your protocol to make things better. In our uh, clinic, 
we really try to, to do the test as, as cheaply and as cost effectively as we can for people. But we find that doing the tests is absolutely necessary for um, knowing how to best handle you. One of the questions I get is how often do we want to retest patients? This depends on the patient and on the speed they're going and also just on the type of person they are. Some people really want to do testing really frequently because they want to just see data and follow really close. Other people, it's a budget issue and they really only want to retest, spend the money on that when it's, when it's a little more available. So most of our patients will retest every three to six months with the quicker end being that three, sometimes two months range and the longer side being about six months. I tell people you really want a road sign to kind of tell you where you're at at least every six months. Now this doesn't mean you have to retest everything. Sometimes you can just retest a few markers to get an idea of what you're doing and if that's being successful. But that's our usual answer is three to six months is a good time frame for running some kind of retests to see how what you're doing is working.